So today I'll, I'll, I'll basically use the, the, some of the things that we discussed in the first two, the first two meetings and, and then try to make a, to play the forecast game and then to try to say something about what, what, the, what the evidence looks like in, in Argentina today and then how can we use the, the things we have been discussing in order to try to think what the next 15 years uh, can be. And of course I'm going to be doing it uh, with the focus on growth, uh, with the idea that growth, sustained growth for a long period, 15, 20 years, is basically what, is, what can transform uh, a region and then make the welfare of the 10% poorest people in the country way, way better. So. Uh, so in a sense, what, so the idea is to try to think on what the situation is going to be in Argentina in 2025, and then try to learn which are the features that would eventually make the country grow at, let's dream, 5% a year GDP per capita for 20 years. That would definitely make Argentina in 20 years way richer than what Spain is today, uh, and then the ability to, to provide much better economic conditions to the poor is going to be drastically different. On the other hand, one can think of a scenario in which the next 20 years of Argentina's GDP performance look like the last 20, which means that then it's going to be as poor as it is today, at least relatively, and then the ability of the economy to give a better life to the poor people is going to be totally, totally different, as bad as it is today. Uh, so I'll try to, go to, to draw from the, 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 the ideas that we discussed in the first two meetings, and then look at what the evidence looks today, then uh, try to, 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 to look at some of the features of economic policy that could be making a difference today. So I'll just go through two or three of the plots that we discussed in lecture one. And then I go through some of the, of the conclusions that we uh, obtained in lecture two. And then I'll go to look at the details to, of, of, of Argentina's situation today. Um, so in doing that, I will review the performance of the Argentinian GDP per capita of the last years. Um, some of it we already saw in lecture one, and I'm going to repeat it today. <coughs> Then basically what I'm going to do is to, to just make a forecast of Argentina's performance between 1960 and 2000 based on the, on the simple model that we discussed in our lectures uh, from the viewpoint of 1950. Okay, so I'm going to just assume we were, we were having this discussion but in 1950, then I'm using the model to try to forecast what the performance of Argentina would have been from 1960 to 2005. Then I'm showing you the, the, those forecasts and I'm showing you the evidence. That's what I mean by simulating Solos model. Solos model is basically uh, uh, the production function that we saw the other day plus a rule for capital accumulation. And again, we'll review the idea that by accumulating capital, by just making investment grow, one can make the economy grow, as opposed to using the total factor productivity, the, 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 the efficiency with which one uh, combines uh, inputs. Okay, so that's what I mean by simulating Solow's model. Uh, as I go through the, 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 the pictures, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the issues again. I just want to give you the, the broad picture of what I, what I want to get to. Then I'll start telling you some budget constraint of the government, simple accounting stories. Okay, so basically the government raises taxes, then spends money, and also has monetary policy, and I will relate the, these things in a very simple conceptual framework. And then I'll show you data on those, on the, on the budget constraint of the, on the, the main items in the budget constraint of the government. Um, in the end, I will argue that uh, basically bad fiscal policy can be I cannot really convince you, but, uh, but I'll try to provide evidence that suggests strongly that bad fiscal policy has been 
the main uh, responsible for the lack of growth in Argentina, then I'll just, without giving you any numbers, I'll argue that that's a Latin American phenomenon. Uh, and then I'll go to what happened in the last four years or five in, in Argentina. I'll compare them with the previous period in Argentina of very high growth, which is 1990 and 1994. And then I'll tell you what are the differences in economic policy now from what they were there and, and why these differences might be important. Okay, so first two um, topics today is just to review what we have done in terms of growth and, and, and the conceptual framework. And then I'll go through the, through the Argentinian experience of the last 40 years. Why is that an important exercise? Well, these are, I'm, I'm just showing you, again, the first two plots we saw in the first meeting. This is the Latin American experience from 1935 to 1971. I have here, I guess these are seven Latin American, large uh, Latin American countries. Uh, the black line is the average. This is GDP per capita in all the region relative to the US. And then for the different colors, you have different countries. So this, the four countries here are Brazil, Peru, Colombia, and, and Mexico. Uh, and the three countries there are Argentina, Chile, and, and Uruguay. So basically what you see is that a tendency to go down by a little bit on the top, a tendency to go up by a little bit on the bottom. That means that the average, the Latin American average has been growing up for over time by very, very, very small amounts. Now, the, and the whole thing changed dramatically from 1970 on. So if we look at the last 30 years, well, this is pretty much the, the experience. The Latin American average went down, and pretty much every country went down, except Chile. Chile is the yellow one, which has been growing a lot since the middle 80s, but basically catching up everything that had lost from the early 70s to the middle 80s. Okay, so this is basically, so basically I want to concentrate on this. This meant that the, the, if you go to the best year, by the late 70s, the average of Latin America was one-third of the GDP per capita in the U.S. If you look at now, we are around 23, 24 percent. So this was 10 percentage points of, uh, uh, of lagging behind the, the U.S. Okay, so when I look at the, even though this picture is pretty bad, I'm going to concentrate on this one, which is, which is even worse. Okay? Um, and note that particularly it's, it's after the late 80s, 70s, this is a few years before the first debt crisis, uh, that then the Latin American countries do very poorly for over 20 years. Again, for these 20 years, the exception is Chile, which in a sense is going to feed my, 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 my logic. So the one I will concentrate now is the blue line there, which is the Argentinian experience. Okay, so this is just facts. This is what happened to GDP per capita in the region. Uh, to make it contrast, these are the same numbers for Europe from 1950 to the year, to the year 2000. Um, so you have the northern richer countries in Europe in the 50s, the southern poorer countries in Europe in the 50s, these are Spain, Portugal, and Greece. Uh, and you see all of them go up relative to the US. Okay, so the contrast is this thing going up as opposed to in, in Latin America and this thing going, going down. And the numbers are large. I mean, these countries go from like 0 0.2 and, and 0 0.6 of the US to 0 0.4 and 0 0.8 of the US. So that's basically a 20 percentage point uh, catch up with the U.S. As in this period, Latin America had a 10 percent negative catch up. So it's, uh, I don't know how you say the negative catch up in English, but that's, that's what happened. So as these countries were going up, from here Latin America was going down. So I'm not going to talk anymore about Latin America today, just talk about Argentina as a representative country of, of, the, of, the, of the bad performance. Okay, so that was basically what we talked in the first day. What about the second day? Uh, the second day we tried to go through which are the things that make the economy grow uh, or an economy grow. And then just throwing capital into the economy was basically not the solution for growth. Okay, we show 
maybe the, the most clear example was the, 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 the simulation made for, for Zambia that we, that we discussed, and, and in which the, 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 if, if the accumulation of capital was the answer, and then one computes the, all the aid that went into Zambia, and if that would have been transformed into investment, Zambia should be like 15 times richer today than what it is. Um, so as opposed to that, we, are, uh, we argued that it was basically TFP growth. It's the ability of, the, of an economy to be more efficient than just accumulating resources, what makes GDP per capita grow, grow a lot. So in addition, when the economy becomes more efficient, then there are further incentives to accumulate capital. So there is going to be a, like a natural incentive for, for higher investment rates when TFP grows. But this, the engine that makes the economy grow, or at least the engine that makes economies grow, when one looks at the economies that grow, is basically TFP growth. How efficient the economy becomes in uh, using the, the resources. And then, by the end, we went through some evidence of the, of the US in which I was showing that when one looks at the total efficiency of the economy, that's like a very smooth number. It goes 2% a year, 3% a year, and it, there, there are some cyclical variations in recessions that is a lower rate of growth. In booms, it's a little bit higher. But, uh, but when one, one looks at the average for the economy, that's like very smooth. Now, on the other hand, if one goes and looks at TFP growth across sectors, there was a huge vari uh, volatility. It could go like from 80% growth of TFP in a decade to 0%. When one averages across all these sectors, then one gets like a smooth, a smooth average of around two, between two and four percent for the whole economy. But there is a lot of going on when one looks at the different sectors. So essentially, what is it, this, this, this TFP growth that I was arguing? Well, basically, hundreds of thousands of people that are trying to reduce costs to get larger market shares, and then they eventually find out ways of becoming more efficient. So we have a list of examples of what this TFP growth means. Uh, the favorite one we have is that the, when you start, uh, well, the idea, uh, is the, how is linear montage? Uh, assembly line, right? So that you become much more efficient at producing cars, because instead of having like a couple of guys doing a car, you have a particular one doing a small piece of it. And then when you just do the whole thing together, you end up by producing much more cars with the same amount of people. So that's our favorite example. We don't have many more of those, but there are tons of these examples in, the, in, the, in, the, in, 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 different, in different sectors. Sometimes you just change the way in which the different workers sit in an office, and then they are you such that they you are put together the ones that are friends, they're happier, and then they produce more. All these kinds of things which are very small and tiny and, and, and sometimes not necessarily bright or extremely bright ideas, but they improve a little bit the productivity, uh, makes that on average. And then you have uh, uh, the, the economy will end up by being a little bit more efficient every year. With a lot of winners and a lot of losers. There are going to be sectors that will boom for like over a decade, and other sectors in which people will be trying to do these things that will not be successful. And that's what like, very famous economists in the first half of the 20th century, Schumpeter, called creative destruction. Is it really like hundreds of thousands of people that are every day wake up in the morning and they try to think in ways in which they can do whatever they do in a better way? And then eventually you get sectors in which these becomes like a very profitable business, and they make a lot of money, and they increase productivity a lot, like with these kind of things that, uh, that we use today. When I wrote my first term paper 20 years ago, in this university, I used a typewriter. When you look at the productivity growth that, the, that these uh, machines experience over the last 20 years, totally different from the productivity growth of cars. Cars are pretty much the same. Now they come with GPS, but if you know the city, that's not such a big deal. OK? Uh, so there's a lot of differences across sectors. Um, but when you have this army of people that they're basically trying to lower cost every single day after a year, when you add up for the whole economy, there is a lot of heterogeneity. But in the economies that grow, that accounts like for 3 4% increase of total productivity a year. I'm going to argue that bad fiscal policy shut down 
these mechanisms in Argentina in the last 30 years. So let's go then to, to Argentina. Okay, this is TFP growth, and TFP growth is just an army of people trying to make more money and reduce cost. Okay? So let's go to Argentina. I'll show performance of Argentina again, and then I'll simulate the solo model. I'll go to the budget constraint accounting, government fiscal policy at the very aggregate level. Uh, then I'll show you data on this budget constraint policy, and at the end I'll compare the experience of the and it will become very clear why 1994 and 2002, 2006 are two periods that one would like to compare once I show you the numbers of Argentina. Here is, again, this is, this is not relative to the U.S. This is just real GDP per capita in Argentina, and I'm just picking the 1970 and making that equal to one. Okay, so when this goes up, it means that GDP per capita is growing. When this goes down, GDP per capita is falling. This is a pretty depressing picture. It's hard to find countries in the, in, the, in the world that basically have this flat structure and it's such a huge volatility. You have other countries that look like this. Most of them are like in Africa. You have other countries which had like major civil wars for like a decade. But countries in which uh, the, you didn't have things like that and, look, and the numbers look like this, you're not going to find many. Although you're going to find some in Latin America, they didn't do that bad. Remember, in the first picture of Latin America, the worst of all cases was Argentina in terms of, of, the, of, the, of the performance of the last 30 years. So what, is, what, what basically goes on? If you go from 1970 to 1980, I mean, this kind of grows a little bit if you look at the whole decade, but definitely not much. So there's like a little bit of an upward trend. This is 1980, so from 1980 to 1990, this basically, uh, this is, goes down, okay? This is like a, an awful decade. This means that I mean, the GDP per capita was 25% lower in 1990 than what it was in 1970. One thing's about this thing growing like a 1%, 2% a year, if you grow at 2% a year, in 20 years, you grow more than 50%. This is a 25% drop. Then, in 1990, this grows a lot until 1998, with a, an important recession here. But when you look at the whole picture, it appears that it was very bad recession. It really uh, was large. But the recovery was very, very fast. So in a sense, you see like a period here until 1998 in which this goes up. And then a recession here, a huge depression, and this is the story since 2002. This is just a description of what, of what the numbers do. Um, why 1990, 1994, and 2002, 2006 are interesting for me? Because these are two periods of very large recoveries. Then there was a financial crisis here in 1995. Uh, but when you look at this thing here, and this thing here, that looks like pretty similar to me. And then I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, so they're basically the only two periods. Uh, well, you could also argue about 1996 and 1998. Uh, that definitely could, could, could go that way. But basically, we have only these three periods of, of very high growth. So of course, the question is whether this thing is just going up and will stay there for another 10 years going up, or if we'll keep on going around this, this straight line. That, that's, that's, what, that's what we would like to know. We won't, but we'll guess. We'll make our best guess. I'll make my best guess. So. The, the, the numbers before were from 1970 till 2005. Okay, so the, what the, what basically was the same line here. This line here is actually what happened with Argentina's GDP uh, from 1950 to 2005. So what are the other two lines? Okay, because there is the other, 
the three lines look like very similar until here. Uh, so they start being different from here on. So the, the, the red one that definitely didn't come up from a computer system is that came from the data is the data. So what are these other two lines? Well, this is an exercise you can do. You can take the conceptual framework we, used, we, we, we discussed in the first lecture, in which output is a, depends on how much people work and then how much capital the economy has. When you divide by the total, by the population of the country, what you get is that GDP per capita is a function of basically two things, how, much, how many people you have working, the ratio of employment to population, and how much capital per capita you have. Then I added a third term, which is the total factor productivity, how efficient the economy is at producing uh, uh, goods. So you can get that conceptual framework starting 1950, get numbers that are reasonable for, for Argentina, which is relatively easy to do. And then you can imagine you are somebody in 1950 making a forecast of what Argentina GDP is going to be for the next 55 years. And use that model to make the forecast. Now, in making that forecast, you can make two assumptions regarding TFP. What, what, how, 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 the efficient, how efficient the economy will become in the next 55 years at producing goods and services. So the blue line is what happens to your forecast of GDP per capita if you assume that productivity will grow from 1950 to 2005 at the same rate that it had been growing for the last years before 1950. Okay, so this, the, the, the blue line and the dotted line are lines that anybody could have made in 1950 using data from 1950. Okay, so you stay there and you say, well, there's going to be some investment rate. And you're going to assume that the investment rate is going to be the same that has been so far. But then you have to take a stand on what you think in 1950 productivity will grow for, from 1950 to 2005. And here I'm working with two different assumptions. The blue line is basically assuming that productivity will grow at 1.7%, which is the growth that it had in Argentina from 1940 to 1950. So it's basically as if TFP in Argentina would have keep on growing as it had done in the 40s for all these 55 periods, then the blue line is the forecast. What, if, what, what forecast is the dotted line? Well, the dotted line, if I ask, is, is the, what the forecast if I assume that productivity does not grow at all from 1950 to 2005. So in one case, I'm assuming productivity grows at 1.7% a year. In the other case, I'm assuming productivity grows at 0% a year. Why do I like this picture? Basically for two things. If you look at the forecast until 1975, basically we're pretty much on target. In a sense, this plot is telling me that until the mid-70s, the Argentine economy pretty much behaved as it had behaved before. Okay? This is until 1975. I'm going to go back a few plots. The blue line is Argentina's GDP per capita relative to the US. In the 30s, it was around between 50% and 55% of GDP of the US. And by the late, early 70s, it was pretty much on the same level. It grew as the US. It's not great. I mean, many economies grow much faster than the US, particularly if they're, uh, the poorer they are. And of course, there are variations over time. But over all these periods, you don't see like a very poor performance, as you see starting in the middle 70s on. Okay, so basically, the model that I've showed you here, that I'm simulating, is telling you a story which is totally consistent, which actually you could have told in 1950. And it's totally consistent with the numbers I showed before. Until the middle 70s, a model that says nothing much changed in the Argentine economy from 1940 or 1930 till 19 to the mid 70s will do fine. But something happened here. Now, if you accumulate whatever happened in the middle 70s until 2005, 
We're making actually an amazingly perfect forecast of GDP per capita in 2005 under the assumption that productivity grew at 0% a year from 1950 to 2005, which basically means that the productivity level of Argentina today is the same productivity level that in 1950. Of course, that's not true that it, it was always constant, because for, the half, for half the sample, it grew at around 1.7%. But then it dropped, such that today we have basically the same TFP that we had in 1950. If you look at countries like, uh, like Korea, this number, the, this TFP grew like at around 5% a year, pretty much since 1960. If I put 5% a year, this is going to be uh, third homes for everybody. Picking Korea is biased, right? It's one of the countries that grew the most for the last 40 years. But basically, there are two messages then that I want to get. is nothing much happened. It was not such a great performance until the middle 70s, but still Argentina was 50% of the GDP per capita of the, of the US. But then, from, from the middle 70s on, it basically uh, lost relative to the US to the point that today, GDP per capita is pretty much what would have been forecasted by a model that assumes no productivity growth. So if productivity growth is what, what makes an economy grow, we understand why Argentina, Argentina's GDP per capita didn't grow. A lot of fluctuations, a lot of major things going on in the middle. And I'm going to use those major things going on in the middle to argue that fiscal policy is really to be blamed of. And then I'll just push the frontiers of what I reasonably believe to argue that that's actually the Latin American problem of the eight, particularly the 80s, and probably the 90s too. Even though I don't know much about fiscal policy in all the other countries. OK. Uh, let me go. So then I, I show you, again, the bad performance of Argentina. And then I argue that, that something happened in the 70s. From 1950 to 1975, the thing was reasonably OK. From 1975 on, the thing really went bad. And when you look at, let me go back again. When you look, when you look of course, there are like wiggles around. But pretty much, the thing went all the way up, and then it just went to converge to this other line. But I will go to the wiggles now. I'll try to make a relationship between fiscal policy and the wiggles. In a sense, I will try to argue, if I go back a couple of slides, that fiscal policy will explain me why this thing went down, why these things went up, why it went down, and why it's going up again. And I will even make uh, statements about from like the traditional theory, we would argue that today in Argentina there are a lot of what we call microeconomic distortions like price controls and things like that, just for the sake of making statements simple and eventually provocative, I will say that's totally irrelevant relative to other things that are also going on in the economy. So in order to be able to get there, let me go through a very simple accounting exercise. I'm going to call this the budget constraint of the government. I'm going to call G whatever the government is government expenditures in every single year. And then I'm going to call T what is government revenues, taxes. OK? So G minus T is basically what we usually call the primary, when that thing is positive, we call it the primary deficit. Right? Like now, I guess, probably some of you can correct me if I'm wrong, expenditures in the US are large because there is a war in Iraq, and they're larger than revenues. OK, so something else must happen, right? Because the government needs to raise the money in order to pay for that G. B, capital B, is going to be government debt. All the T bills that are around the economy. And the government has to pay an interest rate on those, on those T bills. 
Okay, it's the interest on the debt. So actually, in, 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 in this year, what the, what the government will have to pay is going to be whatever is spending above the tax revenues plus the interest on the debt. Now, how is the government able to spend more than what it collects and on top of that pay interest on debt? So forget about the last term. It borrows more. Right? That's, that's the way, actually, we also do it. If we want to buy a house and the, the, whatever we spend is going to be much more than our income on that year, how do we manage to buy the house? We get a mortgage. So if you forget about this fourth term, uh, actually the second term on the right-hand side, this is a totally standard budget constraint which is common to each one of us. Right? If we actually want to pay that, how do we do to pay a mortgage every period? That means that our debt at the end of the year is going to be lower than the debt at the beginning of the year. That means that the term on the right, again, forget about the MT plus 1 minus MT, the term on the right has to be negative. Well, that means that you have to take part of your income and then consume less than your income, so you're going to have something to pay for your mortgage. Okay, so this is basically, and then why do you have to pay more than the actual money they give you? Because they are going to be interest that accumulate over time, right? So that's the term BTRT. So the more you go into the future, the lower your debt is going to be. So the first three terms are absolutely standard and normal. Now, when we're talking about the government, the government has a difference, many differences with each one of us, but one of them that they issue money. They print money. They are the only ones that can print money, at least legally. Okay? So that basically means that, well, if you have to finance a war and maybe people's not really buying T bills, then you can just print dollars and then bring those newly printed dollar bills and pay your soldiers with those dollar bills. So basically, the government has this additional term, which is the revenue that it gets from printing money. Now, What's the problem with printing money? That when you print a lot of money, then you have a lot of inflation. That's why most governments try not to use the printing money source of, of funding for government expenditures. OK? But some countries eventually did. So what is important from this, for, the, for this equation? If the left-hand side of the equation is positive, by this I mean you're spending more than your revenues, then the right-hand side has to be positive, which basically means that when you run a deficit, either you're borrowing, which means your debt is going up, or you're printing money. So if your fiscal policy is going to be such that your left-hand side is positive for like many years, either of the two things, the following two things must happen. If you use money to, find, to, find, to finance that, that, that deficit, then you're going to create a lot of inflation. But if you don't use money, then your debt will grow up over time. We don't have the printing money side, so in our case, it would only be debt going up over time. If you have a lot of debt, well, that means that you've been consuming much more than what you have been generating, which means that eventually you have to start changing things such that you save to pay the debt. Well, the government has an additional alternative, which is printing money. The problem with that is that it generates inflation. So large budget deficits imply either high inflation or increases in public debt. Is this like a huge problem? Well, if it's well managed, no, it's not. Every time the US had a war, including the civil war, uh, by the end of the war, there was a huge amount of debt. Because typically, when you're spending a lot of money to finance a war, you don't want to be like raising taxes at the same time, so you issue debt. Then if you look at the years after the, the wars, there were basically budget surpluses, such that then the, the, they would be paying the debt. So in general, it's not a particular problem to have a budget deficit at a given period. But a budget deficit today means higher taxes in the future or lower government expenditures in the future. So you pay for that debt. And then an alternative, which in Latin America was very popular in the 80s, uh, was is to print money and then create inflation. 
if you go from 1969 to 1991, in, those, in that 20-year period, the Argentinian Central Bank took 13 zeros out of the currency in different periods of time. That means that I, I, I don't even know how to call a number which is a 1 and then 13 zeros on the right. But one peso of Argentina today is equivalent to that number of pesos in Argentina in 1969. Okay? Lot, very high inflation rate for very long periods. And that was basically large budget deficits, finance, not with debt, but with money. Why? Well, we can talk about that. But uh, before that, let me show you the evolution over time of the left-hand side of this equation. I'm going to show you the deficit plus the interest on debt. Divided by GDP, okay, if I tell you like millions of dollars, we wouldn't know what that means. So I'm going to tell you relative to what's the total production of Argentina, how large was the left-hand side of this equation. And that's the number. Numbers here are the fraction of GDP. So like when you read 6, that means 6% 6 of GDP. I have to take into account that in Argentina, government expenditures over GDP are like 25%. So if you have a 12% deficit, it means that you are spending twice as much as what your, of your tax collection. This is from 1966. This is 2005. So as you can see, and actually, I, this, 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 these are numbers I constructed a couple of years ago. Uh, but I was talking to an economic historian uh, for Argentina uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, I was telling him uh, that how this graph was. And he told me, and then I was telling him, look, this from 1966 until 2005, we never had a surplus larger than 2% of GDP. And actually, this is 2004, this is 2005. If you look at 2006, it's going to be even a larger surplus. We never had three years in a row of surplus. And according to what he was telling me, since 1950, until these last three years. So I mean, these, are, these numbers are huge, particularly these ones here and here. So basically, there was no surplus from 1966 to 1991. This meant that either there was inflation or the government was accumulating debt, or both, a little bit of each. So using this budget constraint, I can tell you a very simple macroeconomic or fiscal history of Argentina. From the 60s until 76, like if you look until this year, basically the, 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 the economy was closed. There was no access to foreign debt. The government was, wasn't totally unable to to, to issue bonds uh, abroad. There were very few local debt instruments. The credit market was not very developed. Uh, the Argentinian government didn't have like the, the, their own T-bills to sell and then raise revenues. So most basically, the deficit generated inflation. So if you look at this period, the blue lines are deficits, and the pink lines is inflation rate. Now, the inflation rate, you measure it in this axis. and Basically, this here is going to be around like 600% that year. Uh, that pink there up is going to be like 2,000%. This is a logarithmic scale. So I don't want, I, I mean, this is huge. That's the only thing that matters. I just want to show you what's the evolution over time of this variable relative to the deficit. So until 1976, basically, the deficit was generating inflation. Now, from 1976 to 1983, the economy was open. There was uh, access to, fo to foreign credit markets. And the Argentinian government uh, borrowed a lot of money. Up to the point that in 1983, there was a debt crisis. And also, there was a banking crisis. The old banks were bankrupt, basically. And the Argentinian government declared default. At the same time, I mean, Mexico declared default, Brazil. Uh, Uruguay, many, many, this, that, this is why it's called the debt crisis, Bolivia too. Many Latin American countries had the same, the same evolution from the middle 70s till the early 80s. Access to, credit, to, to capital markets, 
many governments that borrow money. Why did they borrow money? Because they were having deficits, and then the, the, the debt crisis. So if we go then from until 1976, it was basically creating inflation. And from 1986 to 1983, here, during all this period, the deficit was creating some inflation and also accumulation of debt. But then in 1983, there was the debt crisis. In the, in the capital markets, they're not very willing to lend money to a government who's in default. And the, government, the Argentinian government was in default until 1992. So basically, from 1980 to 1982, if we go back to the equation, this was basically zero. Nobody lent money to a broken government, which basically meant that when the left-hand side was positive, MT plus 1 had to be larger than MT. It was printing money, and then the printing money created inflation. And that's exactly what you see in here. This is one weird thing in the picture, which is that the deficit was not as large here as here, and the inflation rate was even larger. Yeah, that's kind of tricky. We, we could talk about it, but this, I, I, I don't care. Even if inflation were like this, it would have been like 500% a year. Totally disruptive. So let's, let's not, not worry too much about the, the dimensions, even though one could definitely talk about it. So what happened in the early 90s then? If we go back to the, to the budget constraint, well, the most important thing that happened during the 90s was this blip. Instead of having these very large deficits, we went to a two years in a row of surplus. Not huge, not large, around 1% not, around of GDP. But it was a totally different behavior from what it was in the, in the previous 15 years. So, that's 1991. The particular way in which it was done was with the currency board. Those are monetary details. They're not key. What was very important was a drastic reduction in the fiscal deficits in 1992 to 1994. Actually, it was not only a reduction in the fiscal deficit, they transformed the fiscal deficit into a surplus. And look at what happened with inflation rate. Now, what happened then from 1994 on with the deficit? Well, let's go back. The deficit went down, was a surplus for a couple of years. In 94, it broke even, and they started running deficits again. Now, what, look at what happened with inflation rate. Well, that was the convertibility imposed. Basically, the convertibility meant that the Printing money was not a possibility anymore. So any deficit had to go to accumulation of debt. So all this going up of the deficit here meant increases in the debt. So this is the gradual deterioration of the deficit till 2001. By 2001, the fiscal deficits increased the debt to levels that were unsustainable. December 2001, the government declared default which pretty much was already discounted by, by old credit markets. They, if, you, if you own a bond saying that the Argentinian government owed you $100, you could buy that for $16, $17 in the market in December 2001. That default was pretty much unavoidable at the time by 2001. Why it became unavoidable? Because that was already important in 19, 1994. And it's kept on growing because of these increased deficits during the period. So what's my reading of the 90s? The 90s were a tremendous shock to the fiscal deficit. Right? If I don't put the number, the, the years here, and then I tell you when something important happened with this figure, whatever the numbers, whatever I'm measuring here, you're going to tell me, well, here something happened. And that's true. We had surpluses for a couple of years, but they didn't last long. My reading is that if this number would have been like this, today we would have convertibility in Argentina, and the government would have not entered into default. 
Counterfactuals are counterfactuals. I cannot prove it. So let me go back then. Remember, the, the, I, what I want you to, is to keep in mind this, these figures, OK? Fiscal policy was bad. If you go back, it was not that awful as it was during this period. But 2% deficit, 2.5%. And we had inflation from 1945 to 1970. Inflation was definitely not zero in Argentina. We had periods of 40% inflation, years of over 100% inflation. But again, this is like 600. That's like over 2,000 in a single year. So fiscal policy was not great. wasn't that awful. Uh, but then the economy was pretty. It didn't have the volatility that it had during the during the during the 80s. When you are because inflation was not 50% a month. It would go from 5% to 15% the following month to 50% the following month. It would go down to 5 go. So the macroeconomic uncertainty that there was in the economy was totally huge. When was it? When it got really bad? At the middle of the 70s. And it was a whole disaster until the early 90s. Let's go back to GDP per capita. middle of the 70s to the 90s. What is the relationship with TFP growth? Well, imagine you are trying to design a plan for your, for you. you have a factory, you have 16 employees which are just uh, producing, I don't know, you make shirts. And so you have your 16 people with a factory with the 16 people working, and then you have plans of improving the efficiency, and then you start talking to all of them to find out who gets better along with which one in order to seed them in a way that way you would increase productivity by 4% at the end of the year. Well, in that economy, you have the nominal interest rates of 60% a month. The dollar, the value of the dollar that goes from 40 to 80 in a couple of months. So the source of the, all sorts of financial problems you have the least thing you care about is how you improve that 4% of productivity with those 16 employees. The prices of your inputs are growing up at the rate which are different from the prices at which you can sell. When you are in an economy with inflation, then you have inputs, you buy, and then you sell. And the fun part of making business is at the end of the day, whatever the money you got by selling is more than the money you paid by buying. Because then you have to pay your employees, and you like to have a beer from time to time, too. Now, when you have the prices that are going up at this speed, if you just hold a payment to someone that uh, you owe, okay, you buy the, 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 the scissors that they use to cut and make the, the shirts. And then when the guy comes with the bill, you're not around because you went for a coffee. You wait for a couple of weeks, and all your shirts that you could sell at 100, you sell them at 200. And then the real value that you pay for your scissors is half of what it used to be. So you're basically running a race on the price at which you sell, the prices at which you buy, and then making the difference there. If you win a race by well, for a week in one of these prices, you make 20%. You're not, you're not supposed to worry about who's working with whom and improving productivity by 4%. If you can make these large gains by fooling around with prices, making large gains by fooling around with prices is zero sum game. You're just gaining by making other one lose which is fun still, but, uh, but when you average across products, you don't have an increase in productivity. Well, that's this period. Now, huge change in the fiscal policy. Looked like everything was much better, right? You go check in the numbers, and you see. We had an average of above 4% of GDP. There was not even, I mean, until, until the year 2000, in which it was already pretty bad, the deficit had never been above 2%. If you look to the year previous of 92, there was only one year. You have to go until 1970 to find another year in which the deficit was below 2%. So suddenly you have a whole decade 
in which you are below 2%. So it appears like a huge change in fiscal policy, and it was. It just wasn't enough. The change had to be even larger. This thing made the, made the, the, the debt problem show up again. But for, for many years, it appeared that it's, as it was going fine. And then the economy just boom. It wasn't fun anymore fooling around with prices. October 96, the price of the scissors was exactly the same as it was in March 92. Most of the world is used to that, but not in Argentina in the 80s. That was not the, the way to make money here was not increased productivity at 6% a year. It was just to hit, to buy dollars at the right time and sell them at the right time. You may think this is not the case, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you one experience which I'll know because it happened to me. There was a crisis here, 95 was a tough year. It was also actually a macro crisis. Some people could relate it to the fact that the fiscal policy started deteriorating exactly in 1994, but probably there were other causes too. I'm not, and these things are not good, but I don't worry too much about those. If you look at this year, it was pretty, if you just make a projection here, this was just a problem for two, three years. I mean, that's bad. Unemployment went from 12 to 18 percent. A lot of people had a very bad time. But when you consider what the economy is 20 years from now, well, you're going to have masses of people going from poverty to a more decent life. And then, but during all this period, there was something behind. And that something behind was this thing piling up. That, and here, 2002, actually it was December 2001, was the debt crisis, the, the, the new default. And here we went down the sink again. Now, what happened from 2002 on? Well, oops. Fiscal surplus in 2000. Actually, this is, this is 2003. So 2003 was already, uh, uh, there was, was balance. 2004, 2005, 2006, we have been running at surpluses on average over 3% of GDP, and everything looks like 2007 comes exactly the same way. That will be four years in a row with surpluses, totally unseen in Argentinian macroeconomic history for decades. Let me give you the story here. Together with the, with the default, there was a devaluation. The devaluation was a significant thing because there had been hundreds and thousands of devaluations in Argentina until 1991. In 1991, there was a new currency, and then there was a convertibility rule, a currency board, which basically said that the new peso was going to be equal to $1, and it kept it until 2001, fixed for that 10-year period. It lasted a little bit more than 10 years. So, by the year 94, we had a lot of confidence that this convertibility was solid and that it was going to last for years. So the banks started making loans, mortgages. What do you mean started making mortgages? Well, there are, banks don't lend you much money to buy almost anything when inflation rates are 40% a month. So if you had to buy a house, you had to save for 20 years and then eventually buy a house. By the 94, 95, it looked like inflation was definitely a matter of history. So banks started making loans. And then they would make loans in pesos or in dollars. It didn't matter, right? So one peso was the same to a dollar. Of course, there was always the risk of a devaluation. Um, but the risk was so low that the interest rate were almost the same. They were a little bit higher in pesos. So when I bought a house in 97, I took a mortgage in dollars. Then paid my mortgage every month, as every good citizen does. Um, it was a 10-year mortgage. You don't get 30-year mortgages in, in Argentina, but a 10-year mortgage. So by the year 2001, I had paid four years. I still have six more years to go. You know, at the beginning in mortgage, you pay like, the, what you pay is mostly interest and not capital. So you, by, if you pay for four years out of 10, you owe much more than 50% of what you, what you paid. Actually, at the time, I was owing 70% of, uh, of, of what I have 
borrow. But I'll give you the numbers. I had borrow $120,000, houses that are much cheaper than here. Um, and at the time, I was still owing 85000 This is December 2001. Well, the thing looked pretty bad during 2001. So I had $20,000 in a bank account in Argentina. And then I just took that money and put it in my bank in the US, which was totally legal. And then I waited. Then I devalued in January. And then after the devaluation, a lot of people said, well, we cannot really pay now in dollars because our wages are in pesos. My wage was in pesos too, and still in pesos, and still way less many dollars than what it used to be in 2001, and I work more now. So then they decided that, come on, all these people, they cannot pay in dollars, so they're going to pay in pesos. And the peso was, three pesos was one dollar, so my $20,000 became 60,000 pesos. So I put a little bit more money, and then I canceled my mortgage. So basically it means that I basically got a $40,000 gain just by thinking, when will the government devalue? And what was the right time to take my money out of the bank in Argentina and put it in the bank in the US? You have to work a lot in a company in order to make $40,000 out of increasing productivity. So when you have all this volatility, you don't think too much about productivity. You're thinking, well, was the right time to buy something and then sell it? A great time to buy a house was here. I, had, I only had this $20,000 and then I used it to pay my mortgage because I didn't know when, how long that was going to last. In the end, it lasted all until now. But I had friends who went three months after and they bought a house and they, that house is four times what it was at the time. So when you have all this macroeconomic mess, you don't think too much about productivity. But if these hundreds of thousands of people that in Chile wake up every morning and while they're brushing their teeth, they're thinking how can they make 3% more by increasing productivity. Well, when you have macroeconomic instability on the other side of the Andes, what you have is people thinking, which bank gives me one point more such that with that I'll buy dollars and then when I sell them back, then we're all playing against each other. We transform productivity growth into a casino, a macro casino, which you're just betting in the loans and the dollars and the interest rates. So if you spend all the time betting, this is what happens to productivity. And this is what happens to GDP per capita. When you stop betting, then you start worrying about what you have to worry, then you grow. More betting, now there's not much betting to do. And then we're going up. How does this period is similar to this period? Well. If you look at the numbers, this was four years, and this has been four years. We had a crisis here, but apart from that, it kept on growing. If you just make like a linear projection there, we just keep on growing. Now, do they look alike? Well, What are these two lines? This is GDP per capita for Argentina, two different periods. Which two periods? Right after, well, a little bit before convertibility, but when the economy started, convertibility came a year after the major stabilization. So this is from 1990 to 1994. And I'm comparing it with the period 2002, 2006, which is right after this crisis. So we had a major crisis in the late 80s. We have a major crisis in the in 2001. So I'm starting period zero here at the bottom of each of these crises. So if we go back, I'm, start, I'm putting a zero here, and I'm putting a zero here. And then I'm going to take this number and put it together with this other number, except that I'm going to be showing you quarterly data with all the seasonality uh, in it. So basically, but essentially the plot I'll show you is as if I take this, num this thing here and I move it all the way here. And then I compare the two going up. And what you do, basically this is what you get. The blue one 
is in the 90s, the red one is now. If they look, if you, but the whole point was to argue that these look very, very similar. The growth rates are extremely similar, a little bit better when you go point to point for the red one, which is now, than for the blue one. But very small differences, 2% over a four year period. What's my reading of this? Once you remove the macro casino and people start doing their homework, you grow. And TFP grows. Once you open the casino again, we all go betting. We forget about increasing productivity. So what happened in, the, in these two cases? Well, this was the first big change in fiscal policy, but was not good enough. We left residual deficit, probably combined with external factors, that, that I would agree. Uh, it wasn't so obvious that this was a problem in 96, but the world changed a lot between 1906 and 1999. But even, even though the world changed a lot, if we had had 3% surplus during all the 90s, it, didn't, it, it had not matter what happened in the world. So you remove the casino, and boom, creativity goes there and exploits TFP growth. So how is the casino now? It's totally removed. What's the secret of success today? For me, it's this. Nothing to do with price controls, not letting the privatized, privatized companies to increase the price of oil. When then, I don't think it has anything to do with that. It has to do basically with the fact that we have a government with a fiscal surplus. Governments with a fiscal surplus, they don't make a macro mess, and they can run the economy. When you have deficits, you cannot run the economy. You're printing money or squeezing every possible source in order to get funds. A broken government makes a mess. You can make other messes, even if you're not broke. But relative to the ones you can make when you're broke, they're peanuts. So what's, what's my hope? My hope is that we have a government now that is not going to let this blue curve cross the line. Given that, when I go back and look at the government budget constraint, then I don't see any problem because this number here is going to be negative. We will be able to pay the interest on the debt that we have because we, were, we went out of default. We changed bonds for other bonds with a substantial haircut, but we have to pay uh, interest. This B times R is around 2% of GDP. So with a 3% surplus, we can pay the, the interest and still have 1% more. So we won't need to print money. There's not going to be an increase in debt. So there's no foreseen reason why the government should be broke and making a macro mess again in the future. So if what happened from here to here was that we forgot about working, and we've been betting most of the period. But now the casino isn't there anymore. Now it's only about working. So if the casino has been permanently removed, well, we have a good prospect for growth. How good a prospect? I would say a great prospect. Because this is about catching up on productivity growth that we already had. Productivity level was higher here than there. This isn't about make, make coming up with new things. This is just start doing again things we were doing before. And on the other hand, while we wasted 30 years, the world found out tons of better ways of doing many things. So now we only have to do two things. Remember how we did things before? And that's going to buy us a lot. And copy what the world discovered in the last 30 years where we were betting. So what's my forecast? As long as we stay with this blue line here, around this 3% of surplus, the red line is going to start approaching the blue line. So if this is right, then in 2025, Argentina will have a GDP per capita that's going to be like 60% of the US. 
and then poverty there would be a totally different business than what it is today. How much can you extend these to other countries in Latin America? Well, if you go to Brazil, I mean, the, the, the only one that I don't think fits very well my story is Colombia. If you look at, Chile is the, the yellow one. Very bad fiscal policies until the middle 80s. Amazing fiscal policies from the middle 80s on. Chile today practically doesn't have any debt, the Chilean government. Chilean government was the only one that in the early 90s didn't go to the Brady Plan. The Brady Plan was a plan that uh, Mr. Brady developed that basically meant, okay, we have all these guys that are not paying the debt because it's too large. If we tell them, okay, instead of for every $100 you owe, pay us 70, then they will start paying. Chile didn't need that because by the time Brady came up with his idea, they were already paying the debt without any discount. And today, Chile doesn't have any debt, the government of Chile. And that happened in the middle of the 70s. What about, what about Brazil? Awful fiscal policies. Had inflation rates not as high as Argentina, but lasted longer. The last spike they had was in 1995. What about Peru? Well, there are five countries which really did bad in terms of fiscal policy and inflation in the 80s. Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, and Chile. Chile was in the 70s, not in the 80s. The only one that doesn't fit well my, my story is, is Colombia. And Colombia did, didn't do great either. Uh, maybe Colombia has some other problems. I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not very familiar with the fiscal data on any of these countries. Some of it is not really, it's not easy to, it's, you have to work deeply into the data in order to get numbers that you can compare across decades. Um, but if you look at the whole Latin American region in the middle 70s, fiscal policy basically became awful. And it stayed awful until the middle 90s. And this is a period in which the whole thing went down the sink. That caused 10% of gap between the GDP of Latin America relative to the US from the beginning of the decade to the following one. Uh, but this is, talking about these other countries is much more hand-waving. I don't have the same plots I show you for Argentina for the other countries. Now, look, fiscal policy looks much better today, not only in Argentina, but also in the region. Uh, So that blue line is the target. We only have to keep fiscal policy under control. That's my guess. That's it. Juan, how, how much do you think is possible for the good fiscal policy? Well, that's that 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 that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wasn't, I'm not even going to pretend that I could answer that for the other countries. Okay, here's the here's the thing. If you if you look at numbers like uh, if you look at the surplus, this is a, okay. I'm going to make it in 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 billions of dollars. It's going to be like. 8,000 billion is the, is the, is the 8,000 million, sorry, 8 billion is the surplus today in Argentina. How, so 50% of this if uh, an export tax. And the other 50% is basically a tax on, let me just put it like this, on checks. These are awful taxes. Every time you write a check and then there is a debit in your account, the government charges 0.25% of the transaction. It ends up by adding up a substantial number if you are a large company and, that's, and, and you work with the banks, which is what banks are for. Uh, so this is a little bit of an awful tax. This is not a great tax, You're taxing exports. The exports are a sector in which uh, uh, I mean, you would like, I mean, all the other countries fight to each other because they subsidize exports. Right? So if there's a country who's subsidizing exports, 
that are, and then that country is selling that stuff in your country, and then is competing with your producers, and they're competing with an advantage because they have a subsidy. Then you go and you complain to the uh, uh, organization of trade, and you say, this guy is cheating, and then eventually you say, hey, you have to remove that subsidy. Well, nobody is accusing of Argentina of doing that because we're taxing. It's a 20% tax on sales. It's a huge tax. Uh, now, in spite of not being necessarily the best taxes, uh, there is a question of how long can you hold that tax. Uh, the reason why steel exports are booming in Argentina is because international prices are very, very high, particularly now. So the fact that if the price goes up and the government puts you a tax, it is as if the price didn't go up. So the question is whether this tax could survive a drop in the terms of trade. Um, and I guess not. I guess I, mean, I don't think that you can sustain 15 years of, of, of fiscal discipline with these two taxes. Still, I believe that this, uh, so in the end, the question is whether as a society, we understood that this is something that has to happen. And then whether there's going to be the political will and the political ability to either increase other taxes, improve tax collection, and reduce tax evasion, or adjust government expenditures. It's not obvious. I definitely agree that this three years in a row doesn't guarantee 15 years in a row. You still have another 12 to go. And and it definitely appears that the current tax structure is not, you can't sustain it for another 15 years. So it will definitely require uh, thinking the tax collection differently in order to sustain this for, for another 15 years. I do think this, the good thing of this president, if one can find one, is that uh, this his three year history of surpluses is consistent with I think that over a decade of fiscal surplus in his province when he was a governor. Uh, if that's revealed preference, one would like to believe that when these taxes, if, if these taxes cannot be maintained because of a drop in terms of trade, something else would happen, and then the blue line will not go up. But I, I think that's like the big, the big question in the in the in the future. Uh, but I think that still this is going to be the the, the indicator to look at. As, I think that it, as long as this stays around here uh, with these taxes or others, prospects are going to look very, very good. Because there's not going to be a macro casino. They will just have to do our work. How do you know the causality goes like that? I mean, how do you know it's not that something else is wrong and therefore the government is, has a deficit and rather than because of the deficit? Okay. Um, uh, that, there are two things. Are deficits bad? The answer is no. That's, that's what we do when we buy a house and get a mortgage, right? Individually. There's no conceptual reason why that would be a problem for the government. And we see many experiences. In not only a war, sometimes you have a natural disaster, and then the government decides it's going to spend money, and that's not the time to raise taxes at the same moment. So you just issue debt. And that's why government debt is useful. So I'm, I'm not saying there is anything intrinsically wrong with debt. But it definitely appears that in some circumstances, uh, it can be a problem if you end up by having an, an, an amount of debt that you just cannot pay. That's why you have Chapter 11. That's why you have bankruptcy procedures. Eventually, states of the world happen and you know, were very unlucky for many periods and then you, I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting a mortgage. That's why a bank gives you a mortgage. They come and check. They don't want, they want, banks want people to pay. So you bring your papers. They say, well, let's see. They check on you. You look like a serious prospect. They lend you the money. Two years after that, you'll divorce. You lose your job. Uh, you get a drinking problem for a year. Uh, nobody gives you a job again, and eventually you lose the house. 
And the bank says, well, we're going to take the house. And it's not actually what they were planning to do when they gave you the loan. There may be bankers who actually love uh, that. But the most bankers I know, they don't like to sell houses. Their business is they charge you eight, they get money at three, and that 5% is their business, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. Now, when you are dealing with a government that in 83 defaulted, and in 2001 defaulted, there seems to be a government with a structural fiscal problem in the sense that two, year, two times in 25 years had to say, sorry, I cannot pay my debt. Um, so that's, there's that, 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 that limit that naturally is around that if you get very close to it, then that is a problem, okay? So if you're already in, in large debt, deficits are bad news. If you don't have much of a debt, well, having a deficit is not such a, such a bad news. That's one thing. So uh, uh, there I totally agree with you. The other thing you, you, you raised, and I guess I'm, uh, that, that's a deep issue. Uh, and I agree with you, I'm just fundamentalist about the thing. Uh, and the question is whether the, the, it's not that the economy went into problems and then the government had a, a deficit, which is actually reasonable, right? If you're, tax, if you're taxing 20% of consumption, if you have VAT, which looks like a consumption tax, and that's 20%, and then the, uh, the economy gets into a recession and then consumption goes down, well, your revenues will go down, and then you might have a deficit. Right? So that, that would be a way to think about it. Um, and actually, one can think in some periods, and I, I'll come back to here. He, particularly, if you look at this thing going up until 2001, it's actually because the economy is going down. Not much because the government is spending more. OK? So there is a little bit of that, of that endogeneity problem. Still, I want to think that governments have to choose government expenditures and that there is a principle for governments that they should not spend more than what they make, as that's a principle for most of us. Um, so then, I, I'm not saying it's easy. If I, it would be embarrassing for me to say it's easy, because we've been having all this mess, because in 30 years, we were not able, as a society, to control the left-hand side of the equation. So the fact that you have a recession is very bad news for for the government, because that means that tax collection is going to be lower, so the T will go down. But then you have to adjust the G. You have to have mechanisms such that when you lose your job, then you reduce the expenditures at home. Otherwise, you're going to go broke. So one can always say, well, I go broke because there was a recession, and then I lost my job. And then we'll say, well, one should have kind of thought about that possibility, and maybe you shouldn't have bought that third car or something like that. So it's about, I'm not saying that they, we were buying third cars in terms of, of government spending. But what I'm saying is that this is a principle. The fact that you cannot spend more than what you have, it's a principle that should apply to all of us, including the government. And as we have to think that there are circumstances in which uh, things can get bad, and then you have to kind of prevent from falling into that situation, uh, government should be uh, responsible for that too. If you look at this, this the default and the devaluation were here. In '98 was the peak, so the government could maintain convertibility and the payment of all its debt obligations. '98, '99, 2000, and 2001. But the government had made, uh, had taken several measures, kind of understanding this was a possibility. And it could actually uh, hold the whole thing for four years. I think it was uh, the, uh, um, an article in a French newspaper that was having his fifth article on Argentina is going down the sink. And the title was something as, uh, how, how do you say when the train falls? Uh, derail. derail. So it's the, the longest derail in history. Because everybody knew the train was going to derail, but still was on the rail. It really took a long time because the government had made, I mean, it's not that it was totally stupid. I mean, I, I don't want to suggest that. Um, and if you see the numbers of Chile, you're going to see this bleep here. 
This is associated with the Asian crisis and the Russian default, which somehow changed the way in which capital markets behave, interest rates went up a lot, and then many of these problems had problems. Many of these countries had problems. And if you look at Chile, I mean, they had a recession here. They didn't go down the 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 sink like this here. So, I agree with you that uh, as a different story could be told and say, well, here the economy went very bad, so there was a deficit. But I mean, in a sense, you're responsible for how much you spend. So if your income goes down, then you should be able to lower your expenses. I mean, that's what the rest of the countries kind of do. Or if you think you're not going to be able to do that, then what do you do? Well, you have a pile of savings, right? If you, know, like you have kids at school, you don't want to take the kids from school. Uh, and well, and then if you leave, if you have a job which is uh, has a little bit of uncertainty on whether you can be fired or not, and how fast you can get another job, well, then you save and then try to control for that. So in a sense, I'm not willing to take as right, and I'm, and this is a fundamentalism uh, uh, that the G that the government cannot adjust its fiscal situation. I mean, responsible management of your, of your, of your economic problems uh, means that you have to spend accordingly to what you have. That's a principle that applies to you, to me, to the University of Chicago, to the government too. So, uh, it might be very difficult, and I agree with that. But uh, but that's a problem that, as a society, you have to solve. Uh, otherwise, the government goes bankrupt, and then you pay all this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.